And you know, I they, the, the, your love can tell you how quickly I responded to that email of do I want to introduce Claudia? I'm like, come on, I'm like the biggest fanboy ever, of course. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce um, introduce Claudia and and, and talk about in, not just introduce her, but talk about this wonderful wonderful book. And um, and thinking about it, I thought about how much I hate words like important and courageous, almost as much as I despise the word brave. I hate it almost as, as much as I hate angry. Because America has constricted the purposes of these words and they have shut down the discussion more than they have opened them up. And it makes things too easy to say, it makes the discussion too quick and we like that, we like to slip out of complication to explore ideas as concepts instead of truly feeling them. But what if anger is not an ax or a bludgeon, but a paintbrush? And it's right there in the same toolbox as sorrow, toughness, love, heart, humor, compassion, empathy, contradiction. What if is, as Claudia Rankin says, the state of emergency is always a state of emergence? Because great art resists paraphrase and uh, Rankin, Claudia, Claudia Rankin is too multidimensional a writer, covers so wide and so deep a space, and Citizen is too big a work for such reductive paraphrasing. In fact, reductive paraphrasing is one of the things the book talks about. <laughs> and one of the things that Citizen, such a, an American lyric, such a masterful work anticipates, and I've spoken about this before, spoiler alert, uh, the, the, there's a section which pivots between Serena Williams' stubbornness and rage and Arthur Ashe's dignity and courage to ask the question of what is deemed acceptable black behavior. The question, like so many others, isn't asked so much as unmasked. Is America still so in love with its messy racial concepts because it makes for easy explaining or because it provides a template, not just for racism, but John Henryism and all the other isms that we at once absorb and ignore. And yet, even at its most boldly confrontational, Citizen grabs us with its huge heart and disarming openness. Rankin is far more interested in revelation than confession, and Citizen is a conversation that is already happening. And in each printing, the conversation is literally growing. It's the pre-Ferguson book that feels post. Not just because of how it confronts race and identity, but because you can already feel in reading it that it's an ageless and peerless work of art. Hilton Owls says, it's the best note in a wrong song that is America. I think it's a glorious act of sympathy, but in the original sense of the word, meaning understanding between us. And with such a wide enough space, and such a broad enough space, with a conversation that's already happening, but with space for all of us, you and me, the reader, the poet, the listener, to scoot over and listen, and to speak, and to respond, and to keep that conversation eternally going, which is, it's not an ending, but it's the most fantastic of beginnings. And I'm gonna stop there because I'm really dying to hear. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Claudia Rankin. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers, are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves, war rescued. Then there are these days, each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through these brothers, each brother, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets, and as yet I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. 
if I knew another way to be. I would call up a brother, I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, another dawn, where the pink sky is a bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless, shush. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony, accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging. The rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots, our limbs, a throat sliced through, and when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms, oh blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, their brother, that kind of blue. The sky is the silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If a call, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking, the talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot. Is it cold? Are you cold? It does get cool. Is it cool? Are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is his silence. Eventually, he says, it is raining. It is raining down. It was raining. It stopped raining. It is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there. He's there, but he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. I want to thank um, Marlon for that introduction. Um, um, it's might have been an honor to introduce, introduce me, but it was an honor to have you introduce me, so thank you. This book would not be a book without Grey Wolf Press, so I want to thank everyone, Fiona and Katie and Aaron and Jeff and Marissa, and I could keep going. It's the, the lovely thing about working with Grey Wolf all these years is that you feel like you have this other family. And they help you bring the things into the world that you need to bring into the world. So thank you all. I'd also like to thank the law for hosting us. And the last couple of days, I've had the pleasure of being um, at St. Benedict's with Mark Conway, so I thank you. I, the way the book, um, many different processes happened in order for this book to be written, but one of the ways that it came about was that I went to friends and I said to those friends, will you tell me a story where race entered the room, where you were going about your day, you thought you were going to have a conversation with a colleague or a friend, or you thought you were going to Starbucks to get a glass of water, and, uh, or, or most of us get coffee at Starbucks, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then suddenly, race enters in, and you know what's happening between you and the body in front of you has to do with the deep roots of racism in the American culture. So a, a novelist, a good friend of mine, told me the story. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have, you have only ever spoken on the phone. Her house as a side gate that leads to a back entrance 
she uses for patience. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house, what are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman pincher or a German shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment? She spits back. Then she pauses. Everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh yes, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. One of the amazing things, I mean, my reaction when this was told to me was, um, no way. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but then I said to my friend, what did you do next? And she said, I went to the appointment. Because you, you don't even take it in fully. And so, and then I said, you went to the appointment? She said, yeah, I went to the appointment. And then I went home and I cried. And then I wrote her a long letter telling her that I will never come back again. You and your partner go to see the film, The House We Live In. You ask a friend to pick you up to pick up your child from school. On your way home, your phone rings. Your neighbor tells you he is standing at his window watching a menacing black guy casing both your homes. The guy is walking back and forth talking to himself and seems disturbed. You tell your neighbor that your friend, whom he has met, is babysitting. He says, no, it's not him. He's met your friend, and this isn't that nice young man. Anyway, he wants you to know. He's called the police. Your partner calls your friend and asks, me, asks him if there's a guy walking back and forth in front of your home. Your friend says that if anyone were outside, he would see him because he is standing outside. You hear the sirens through the speakerphone. Your friend is speaking to your neighbor when you arrive home. The four police cars are gone. Your neighbor has apologized to your friend and is now apologizing to you. Feeling somewhat responsible for the actions of your neighbor, you clumsily tell your friend that the next time he wants to talk on the phone, he should go in the backyard. He looks at you a long minute before saying he can speak on the phone wherever he wants. Yes, of course you say. Yes, of course. So not my finest moment, yes, yes. But this is, a, this is what is complicated and torturous and, um, you know, simply sick about racism. Because in my case, I'm thinking I want to protect you from my neighbor. And so my attempt to protect you will be to curtail your rights. Um, which is no kind of <coughs> protection at all in the long run. But this, you know, this is how it's insidious. Luckily, we live, I live in California where um, the police in our town are more interested in Mexicans than blacks. <laughs> You're in the dark, in the car, watching the black tarred streets being swallowed by speed. He tells you his dean is making him hire a person of color when there are so many great writers out there. 
you think maybe this is an experiment and you are being tested or retroactively insulted <coughs> or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. <laughs> Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? You wish the light would turn <laughs> red or a police siren would go off so he would slam on his brakes, on the brakes, slam into the car ahead of you, fly forward so quickly both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. As usual, you drive straight through the moment with the expected backing off of what was previously said. It is not only that confrontation is headache producing, it is also that you have a destination that doesn't include acting, like this moment isn't inhabitable, hasn't happened before, and the before isn't part of the now. As the night darkens and the time shortens between where we are and where we are going. What's interesting about that piece is um, the person who said this, this is somebody whose work I've, I've, I've taught a lot and recommended a lot. And now it's very hard for me to separate out who that is from the work. You know, so I force myself to continue teaching the work because I don't want what I loved in the work to be polluted by what is polluting in the person. But it's hard to pick up the work without feeling the flood of that coming forward. How many people are tennis fans? <laughs> All right, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. How many people are Serena fans? Yeah. <laughs> that is right. So tomorrow she's, um, she's in the final against Maria Sharapova, and we will be cheering her on. What does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? Serena and her big sister Venus brought to mind Zora Neale Hurston's I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. Hurston's statement has been played out on the big screen by Serena and Venus. They win sometimes, they lose sometimes, they've been injured, they've been happy, they've been sad, ignored, booed mightily, see Indian Wells, which both sister have boycotted since 2001. They've been cheered, and through it all, and evident to all, were those people who were enraged that they were there at all, graphite against a sharp white background. For years, you attribute to Serena Williams a kind of resilience appropriate only for those who exist in celluloid. Neither her father, nor her mother, nor her sister, nor Jehovah her God, nor Nike Camp could shield her ultimately from people who felt her black body didn't belong on their court, in their world. From the start, many made it clear Serena would have done better struggling to survive in the two-dimensionality of a millet painting rather than on their tennis court. Better to put all that strength to work in their fantasy of her working the land rather than be caught up in the turbulence of our ancient dramas like a ship fighting a storm in a Turner seascape. This is, um, there's an essay on Serena, but I don't want to, spoiler alert, so I'm not going to read any more. <laughs> I'm going to let you go in there for yourself. I want to leave um, time for questions, so I'm going to read two more pieces. A friend of mine uh, is a lawyer in LA. He grew up across the street um, from Paul Newman, and um, he remembers when Paul Newman would come to his house, you know, ring the bell and say, will you uh, taste this vinaigrette? 
<laughs> he managed to get it right, apparently. Um, his name is Rupert. Rupert. So I said to Rupert, um, Rupert, you're a black guy in LA. Will you come to my house and tell me stories of being pulled over by the police? And he said, all right, I'll do it. What are you going to feed me? <laughs> and he came to my house, he and his wife. And one of the things that um, surprised me was she had never heard any of the stories. And another thing that happened when he told me the stories is I could see him becoming angrier and angrier and angrier. I knew whatever was in front of me was happening, and then the police vehicle came to a screeching halt in front of me like he was setting up a blockade. Everywhere were flashes, a siren sounding, and a stretched out roar, get on the ground, get on the ground now. Then I just knew. And you're not the guy, and still you fit the description, because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. I left my client's house knowing I would be pulled over. I knew, I just knew, I opened my briefcase on the passenger seat just so they could see. Yes, officer, rolled around on my tongue, which grew out of a bell that could never ring because its emergency was a tolling I was meant to swallow. In a landscape drawn from an ocean bed, you can't drive yourself sane. So angry you are crying, you can't drive yourself sane. This motion wears a guy out. Our motion is wearing you out. And still, you are not that guy. Then flashes, a siren, a stretched out roar. And you are not the guy and still you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description. Get on the ground. Get on the ground now. I must have been speeding. No, you weren't speeding. I wasn't speeding. You didn't do anything wrong. Then why are you pulling me over? Why am I pulled over? Put your hands where they can be seen. Put your hands in the air. Put your hands up. Then you're stretched out on the hood, then cuffed. Get on the ground now. Each time it begins in the same way. It doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Flashes, a siren, the stretched out roar. Maybe because home was a hood the officer could not afford, not that a reason was needed. I was pulled out of my vehicle, a block from my door, handcuffed and pushed into the police vehicle's back seat, the officer's knees pressing into my collarbone, the officer's warm breath vacating a face, creased into the smile of its own private joke. Each time it begins in the same way, it doesn't begin the same way. Each time it begins, it's the same. Go ahead and hit me, motherfucker, fled my lips. And the officer did not need to hit me. The officer did not need anything from me except the look on my face on the drive across town. You can't drive yourself sane. You are not insane. Our motion is wearing you out. You're not the guy. This is what it looks like. You know this is wrong. This is not what it looks like. You need to be quiet. This is wrong. You need to close your mouth now. This is what it looks like. Why are you talking if you haven't done anything wrong? And you're not the guy. And still you fit the description because there is only one guy who is always the guy fitting the description in a landscape drawn from an ocean bed. You can't drive yourself sane. So angry, you can't drive yourself sane. This charge the officer decided on was exhibition of speed. I was told after the fingerprinting to stand naked. 
I stood naked. It was only then I was instructed to dress, to leave, to walk all those miles back home. And still, you're not the guy. And still you fit the description because there is only one guy who's always the guy fitting the description. I said to him, because I'd never heard Exhibition of Speed as a, a ticket, and he said that it's actually like a trumped up charge, which means drag racing um, through the streets. And in a way, when the police have made a mistake, and if, if they're not feeling antagonistic, they give you the exhibition of speed because you can throw it out. You can usually dispute it. So instead of saying, I made a mistake, they'll give you exhibition of speed. But if you don't know that you can get it thrown out, then you get, you know, so it becomes a kind of swirl. Welcome to my life. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little distressing, I have to say. Or maybe that's an understatement, I don't know. I'm going to um, close with, uh, since it's a big tennis weekend. <laughs> I'm going to close with a piece about watching tennis. To live through the days, sometimes you moan like deer, sometimes you sigh. The world says, stop that, another sigh, another stop that. Moaning elicits laughter, sighing upsets. Perhaps each sigh is drawn into existence to pull in, pull under, who knows. Truth be told, you could no more control those sighs than that which brings the sighs about. The sigh is the pathway to breath. It allows breathing. That's just self-preservation. No one fabricates that. You sit down, you sigh. You stand up, you sigh. The sighing is a worrying exhale of an ache. You wouldn't call it an illness. Still, it is not the iteration of a free being. What else to liken yourself to but an animal, the ruminant kind? You like to think memory goes far back, though remembering was never recommended. Forget all that. The world says, the world's had, had a lot of practice. No one should adhere to the facts that contribute to narrative, the facts that create lives. To your mind, feelings are what create a person, something unwilling, something wild, vandalizing whatever the skull holds. Those sensations form a someone. The headaches begin then. Don't wear sunglasses in the house, the world says, though they soothe, soothe sight, soothe you. The head's ache evaporates into a state of numbness, a cave of sighs. Over the years, you lose the melodrama of seeing yourself as a patient. The sighing ceases, the headaches remain. You hold your head in your hands, you sit still, rarely do you lie down. You ask yourself, how can I help you? A glass of water, sunglasses? The enteric coated tablets live in your purse next to your license. The sole action is to turn on tennis matches without the sound. Yes, and though watching tennis isn't a cure for feeling, it is a clean displacement of effort, will, 
and disappointment. The world is wrong. You can't put the past behind you. It's buried in you. It's turned your flesh into its own cupboard. Not everything remembered is useful, but it all comes from the world to be stored in you. Who did what to whom on which day? Who said that? She said what? What did he just do? Did she really just say that? He said what? What did she do? Did I hear what I think I heard? Did that just come out of my mouth, his mouth, your mouth? Do you remember when you sighed? Memory is a tough place. You were there. If this is not the truth, it is also not a lie. There are benefits to being without nostalgia. Certainly nostalgia and being without nostalgia will leave the past. Sitting here, there are no memories to remember, just the ball going back and forth, stored up by shored up by the external net. The problem is not one of a lack of memories. The problem is simply a lack. A lack before, during, and after. The chin and your cheek fit into the palm of your hand. Feeling better? The ball isn't being returned. Someone is approaching the umpire. Someone is upset now. You fumble around for the remote to cancel mute. The player says something and the formerly professional umpire looks down from his high chair as if regarding an unreasonable child, a small animal. The commentator wonders if the player will be able to put this incident aside. No one can get behind the feeling that caused a pause in the match, not even the player trying to put her feelings behind her dumping ball after ball into the net. Though you can retire with an injury, you can't walk away because you feel bad. Feel good, feel better, move forward, let it go. Come on, come on, come on. In due time, the ball is going back and forth over the net. Now the sound can be turned back down. Your fingers cover your eyes, press them deep into their sockets. Too much commotion, too much for a head remembering to ache. Move on, let it go, come on. Thank you so much. <laughs>